We're not on Facebook. That's why I was like, I was looking at it and I saw Facebook. Well, okay, we're live. I, hey, Mr. Sniper, how are you? Oh, of course, lovely. We love Mr. Sniper. We love Mr. Now, the reason that we have a Facebook link in the document for the podcast, he's in there, Killer. He's in there. For those of you that we might not have picked up, looking at the wave, we might not have picked up. Sam hit the microphone. I did hit the hand. microphone. It was an accident. But I used I use a Facebook link because that's where I first saw it, and I just oh. wanted to make sure I didn't lose it. I, I have I have since updated the link as a D&D Beyond link for the article. Did I? It still says Facebook. I still have, where's my fucking... Yeah, D&D Beyond.com slash posts, and then it has the Facebook tag at the end so that it's like a source tag from where that link was originally clicked from. Wow. Come now, Sam. You work, in, you work in IT. You should know I this. I don't work... Yeah, I work in backend. Touche. Regardless. Could be better. Regardless. Oh, sorry to hear that. Oh, well... All right. <laughs> are we, this is, are this we recording? Is a fucking mess. Yes, we've been recording. When, we usually, you usually make a big deal out of going recording. You didn't. I know. But I, we were we were kind of rolling into it. That's also why I repeated the whole Facebook thing. Oh, okay. you know. Well, you know. But now we're pulling the veil back on all of that. I uh, you, you're seeing the behind the scenes here yeah. at the Dungeon Bros HQ. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, this is episode 33 of the illustrious Dungeon Bros podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. And we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. But... We love D and D again. I mean, to be fair, we never stopped, we never stopped loving D and D. That's true. That is true. It is Wizards of the Coast that we took issue with. Yes, and while we may not love them anymore, they are slowly scraping themselves from the shit list. You know, they're they're they they poop their pants in public. Let's they say did. that. They, oh. And then That's and everybody's metaphor. been everybody's been shaming them. Rightfully so. Rightfully As so. They didn't just simply shit their pants and were ashamed of it and then went to clean themselves up. They shit their pants and were like, yeah, we're shitting our pants. Why aren't you letting us shit our pants? Fuck you. Yeah. And made a big deal about it with and everyone. And it was smelly. Everybody, No one could take their test. Yeah. Then we started taking all of their shit from them. <laughs> we stopped giving them money. Yeah. We started spraying them with water. And now they're like, you know what? We've listened to the community and we think we shouldn't shit our pants anymore. I'm sure that this is that there's going to be at least a, there's going to be at least a shart here in the next couple of weeks. There's going to be constant sharts. I think. Gonna, well, I mean that's they've been sharting for. They're they're gonna they're gonna try to recontrol their bowels. Yes, but yes. I don't think anybody's going to uh, let them get away with um, even the eek, those that just eke out. Yeah, they're not even it, they might be able to get away with a silent but deadly fart. Mm-hmm. But the moment they start like doing like butt cheek clapping farts, that's People are already on edge oh, yeah. with the shitting pants incident. So for those of you not tracking this metaphor at all, <laughs> we kind of kind of got lost a little bit. Uh, tune into last week's or last episode of the podcast, episode 32, where uh, we did the deep dive of everything that Wizards of the Coast has done to just completely fuck up any goodwill they've built over the last decade and a half. Yep. Uh, they they tried to create a new version of the open gaming license for content creators and uh it was bad. It was bad. It was real bad. No one liked it. You can get into the details of that later, but for this episode, things are good again. Things are on their way to being good again. They're, they're on their way to being good. And it seems that the community at large has actually made an impact on a large corporation. Well done. Hey, guys. Well done. Good job. Go us. Good job. Go team. Go, go team. Go everyone. Go team. Well done. When you cancel a bunch of subscriptions to a subscription service, it kind of makes them rethink what they're doing, mm-hmm. which I still I still can't believe that like the the cancellation portal on their website for subscriptions just Went crashed down. entirely. It was ludicrous. Uh, but before we get into all of that, before we get into all of that, we're Critical Role fans. We are. We've been Critical Role fans. That's what got us into D&D in many ways. Yeah. It's what got me into D&D, at the very least. I learned a lot for uh, uh, about the way I do D&D from them. Mm-hmm. Not entirely based on them. But yes, enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it for many years. Indeed. Have, are you familiar with the Creator Clash? Uh, vaguely. I know. I didn't I didn't watch it the past, the first one. Um, and I heard things from, from one of our buddies, uh, Shih Tzu Posting, saying it was mm-hmm. a little disappointing. I mean, well, at the end of the day, uh, the Creator Clash, for those that don't know, is a bunch of online creators from... An innumerable number, so many spheres of YouTube, TikTok, streaming, everything. Uh, they got together last year and 
they created a boxing card with just a bunch of boxing fights and all the money they raised or most of the money they raised went to various charities. Mm hmm. They're doing Creator Clash two, kind of like WrestleMania now. It's gonna be the it's gonna be the the content creator WrestleMania, except they're actually fighting each other more. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. still entertainment. Uh, for those of you, it's kind of similar to what uh, there's a streamer Ludwig. He put on this chess boxing card with like a lot of really really big names in it, mm -hmm. including himself, like C Dog VA, and uh, some other large streamers. Uh, which is kind of a similar vibe, except they were doing chess boxing, which is a round of boxing and a round of chess. And then they go back back and forth. It's hilarious. Love chess boxing. <laughs> One of the most underrated combat intelligent sports of all time. Uh, but the Creator Clash, the reason you might be thinking, why are, why are we talking about this? Creator Clash 2. Electric Boogaloo. Yes. They just announced they're going to be doing it in April. And one Marisha Ray of Critical Role will be participating in a fight against... Someone I don't remember who I did not not a creator we follow or look to for, but gym inspiration, pop pop Marisha Ray pop pop Bob Bob is going to be boxing, <laughs> and the Crit Roll Foundation is one of the charities that will be a benefactor of the money raised. There's also a ton of other creators uh, that like literally you can look at the poster and it's like two dozen plus creators from all over the internet. Uh, I listened to a PlayStation podcast, and one of them, Chris Reagan Maldonado, is also in the Creator Clash mm. fighting against a guy from like old internet, which is ridiculous. <laughs> it, the whole, the whole, the whole concept of this is just completely ridiculous. But very exciting. Going to raise a lot of money. It's it. It seems to be one of the boxing. Just seems to be the easiest like fundraising collaborative sport that people come up with because yeah. there's actually we live in uh, the the greater Cincinnati area and there is a local brewery boxing mm -hmm. uh, tournament that happens I don't think it used to happen every year I think it kind of died out with the pandemic I don't remember if it started up again but the same thing where yeah. every brewery would submit a uh, submit a boxer or a person to go to a box the max and uh, they yeah again donate all the proceeds to charity that's boxing Boxing is just so fascinating about all the spheres that it can overlap into. Oh, yeah. Not, none that you would expect even. And, of course, this whole trend of, like, online creators doing boxing matches started with, like, the the wonderful, he hmm. said sarcastically, yeah. Logan Paul and then KSI and their various boxing matches. And then they're trying to, like, get into UFC shit. And it's like, you're going one way. We're going the, let's keep it goofy and fun. Yeah. <laughs> so, Marisha Ray will be at the Creator Clash. Uh, some other wonderful Critical Role news. Alongside this, they announced well, this is all happening during season two of The Legend of Vox Machina, which we watched the episodes up to episode, what is it, six that's six. out right now. Yeah. I think it's decidedly we, better than the first season. We mainlined them. It's definitely, well, the, 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 they haven't, they have established, they have established something for the people who are not native, mm. um, to the Critical Role fandom because they were well, actually it did bring in a lot of people to their fandom oh yeah uh, first season so yeah the second season being able to just right off the bat hit him with the hit him with the hot stuff hit him with the hot stuff right out of the gate i think the animation quality is better i think the writing is better the pacing i think is a lot better so i i, I like season two a lot season so two far. is i'm enjoying it yeah but alongside the these two announcements they announced there will be a mighty nine animated series that is being funded by amazon the the entire absurdity that is Critical Role leading to multiple highly profitable animated shows on fucking Amazon Prime is ridiculous. Oh, yeah. This this is one of those stories of a company and people that just transcends logic in a lot of ways. Right. You, you know, you go back to their origin story of, of the, the stream itself where it was like, you know, the first time they did it, the producers over at uh, geek and sundry when it was back there didn't even know what dnd was really yeah like this was matt mercer like well we could do this and they're like well oh so there's a video game aspect to it and he goes nah, no no um there's also a pathfinder home game it was before. a pathfinder home game that they convert to 5e yeah it, it, all of that then the first like 30 episodes of the first campaign kind of being objectively poor quality <laughs> Again, they were. Well, this wasn't like well support. This was a. This was more or less just a. They were just doing it. They're just a green light. This was like, all right, we'll green light it for now. We'll see what happens, and then 
campaign i feel like the big inflection point was when campaign one ended they like figured out all their production shit Mm -hmm. and then it's like all right we're starting a brand new campaign it's episode one it gave an easy way for people to get into it because myself included i got in at the beginning of campaign one with episode one like the week it came out because i wanted to start watching critical role but i didn't want to watch the like 124 hour episodes to get caught up so i just started at campaign two and from there, it just it exploded unbelievably. Mm-hmm. And you remember, their stretch goals for the first kick for the Kickstarter for the animated Legend of Vox Machina was like they topped out at like a million dollars. Yeah. Well, originally it was supposed to be a three episode arc, I think. Yeah. And then they're like, oh wait, we've got it. Okay, we'll do a six. Oh, I guess we're doing a full season. We've just been picked up by Amazon. <laughs> literally, literally it went from, oh, you blew past all of our stretch goals in like a couple hours. Okay, we're expanding the stretch goals. Oh, you blew past all of those. Oh, it's now up to like seven and a half, eight million dollars. Oh, Amazon is basically doubling the amount of money we get so that we can put it on Amazon Prime. And now it's just free for anybody with Prime, which is basically everybody. If not, you can find somebody and yeah. steal their Amazon password by beating them up or yeah. asking nicely either way. I prefer beating them up. The, the the entire arc of this is unbelievable and the number of and the number of production companies that i'm sure were like ah, we should have damn it <laughs> just kicking themselves and it's like oh amazon was the one yeah big, big corpo amazon was the one that did it that was fascinating anyway anyway moving on we've got some upcoming releases for the magic of the gathering and the Dungeons and Dragons. Yep, Phyrexia All Will Be One will be coming out February 10th, uh, which is a little a little less than two weeks away from now. Less than two weeks from the recording of this podcast. I'm I'm a lot more excited for Phyrexia All Will Be One now that all of the um the spoiler season and they've basically shown every card. In the yeah, set. they led the they dropped the card list. Yes, I've seen some really cool ones. Um, I I'm 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 going to build a toxic deck. Yeah, I play toxic it. toxic in the mechanic and also <laughs> in. Just being toxic. I mean, most of your decks are toxic. I are you kidding me? Joda's Joda's not really toxic. Yeah. Tolerance kind of toxic, but then it's just tribal. It's just tribal beat down with uh, with combat tricks. You're toxic as a person. How's that? Okay. Um. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then in April we're gonna get March of the Machine. April twenty first for D and D upcoming. We've got Keys from the Golden Vault which is like a heist anthology thing, there's been some write-ups recently because during all of this OGL stuff, they needed to release information about it and uh, kind of got overlooked. Didn't didn't really want to make a big splash about it either in yeah. the midst of all of this. But it's going to be a heist theme adventure anthology similar in the vein of Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel and the Candlekeep Mysteries. A whole bunch of one-shots. We're in favor of these style of D&D books, generally speaking. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you What do you think of the themes here? of the heist i will be very interested to see this because i feel like a heist is a native is like everybody wants to do a heist at some point in their D campaign personally speaking i find a heist somewhat difficult to write very difficult mysteries too which is mysteries why, too which is why i think candle keep mysteries was just such a great product mm-hmm. generally speaking so i think that uh this the keys from the golden vault um, you know, if done well, again, if done well, if done well, could really open up and uh, teach and, and you know have people look how to play a uh, play a heist, how to run a heist, and then you know hopefully here in the coming the coming years, uh, we can look back and and find uh, different YouTube masterclasses based on how to how to run a heist that are Man, better. I hope I hope we can make a masterclass one day that'd be cool that'd be awesome that'd be cool but keys from the golden vault journeys through the radiant citadel and candlekeep mysteries great value books they're going to be you're going to be able to carry them forward into one D D backwards compatible and then also it's just here's a mystery and a setup mm-hmm. that you can play within whatever command with the, whatever mechanics you want to i highly suspect this book will be good um, we'll see if it uh, gets if if it gets a good reception again due to all of this. Uh, uh, the OGLs, the OGL nonsense. On, yes, the charcuterie. No, yeah. um, <laughs> there's a word that I'm looking for, but I can't think of it. But all, all this butt fuckery that's going on, of course. Of course. Um, yeah, 
It's rough. It's rough. And another thing, we didn't get a one D and D play test this month. We did not. Presumably because of all of this stuff. The cleric UA, uh, the survey was open until January 20th. That was over a week ago at the recording of this. And it, if things, I think things have calmed down enough that we can probably expect either the day this podcast posts, which would be our luck, or in the <laughs> week after, like the week of the posting of this podcast, we should probably be getting another uh, Unearthed Arcana for one D&D. Another one. Another one, which would be great. And uh, if you want to check out our previous Unearthed Arcana, we did a bonus episode podcast with uh, another a fellow creator and personal friend of mine, uh, Feldeleb Norb, on YouTube. You can check out the bonus episode of the podcast on podcast services around the globe as well as our YouTube. Let's get into the big thing, though. The big thing. The big one. On... January 27th, Friday, January 27th, there was a post on D&D Beyond from Kyle Brink, the one who, uh, an executive producer for Dungeons & Dragons, who originally posted the, we're going to do a survey about OGL like we treat every other homebrew that we have to see what people think. Within just a couple of days, they had over 15,000 respondents. And here's the big data that they pulled. 88% do not want to publish tabletop RPG content under the proposed OGL 1.2, which is basically, instead of 1.1, they're like, we'll do 1.2, and it's like basically exactly the same with some minor changes. 90% would have to change some aspects of their business to accommodate OGL 1.2. 89% are dissatisfied with deauthorizing OGL 1.0a, the original OGL that 5e has been operating under. 86% are dissatisfied with the draft virtual tabletop policy, and then 62% are satisfied with including the system reference document, SRD content, in Creative Commons, and the majority of those who are dissatisfied asked for more system reference document content in Creative Commons. So here's what, here's what they've said. In response to this feedback, they're leaving OGL 1.0a in place as is untouched. So one, so the original OGL that we've been functioning under for 5e will remain intact as it is. Second, they're going to make the entirety of SRD 5.1, which is the system reference document for the entire 5e system, available under the Creative Commons license. And third, we will be able to pick which license you want to use. This is going beyond what I think anybody was expecting from them. Mm-hmm. What do you think? I was expecting... So we saw them double down basically immediately after all the leaks came out. And then we had a um, a very corporate, a very legalese-esque apology. Yeah, um, not really even an apology. Not really an apology where they blame the community if, for being stupid, basically. <laughs> Yeah. And then and then we got a, we got the Kyle Brink apology, which seemed a little more true, a little more. Now, Kyle Brink Heart specifically, up. executive producer of D&D, I bet he actually like gives a shit. Oh yeah. And this isn't coming from him. This isn't coming from like any of Chris Perkins, any names you would recognize. Yeah. From Wizards of the Coast. It's not them. No. It's it's from the freaking board of directors and CEO and all that dumb stuff. Yeah. So so with that, no one was no one was in on the side of Wizards of the Coast at that point. And we almost expected them to double down again, I think. Almost expected them I to be was, like for sure. Oh yeah. Almost be a double down da- expect them to double down and be like, well, you, you, we we hear that you don't like it, but we're gonna do it anyway. Okay, well we've we we're taking out the royalties thing, but you know, we still need to be able to control this, that, and the other. So to hear that they said that that they see this and they and then and ninety percent of people, eighty five percent and up, are dissatisfied with almost everything you've put out yeah to actually accept that as a company at large and say all right well that thing that we've probably been working on for a while is just we're just canceling it we're shutting it down yeah. to, to to go from so what what i assume based in in corporate terms is that the ogl 1.2 or 2.0 whatever the leaked one was originally was greenlit that means it was go it was right for go live 
and then after this to take something from ready for go live to canceled is a huge corporate like process and a huge, there's going to be people arguing about it for days so to see that it actually happened is uh incredible absolutely absolutely and don't be fooled by the messaging of this this isn't they wanted feedback this is we forced their hand mm -hmm. into doing what we wanted the only reason this was happening it all, I, I would argue it's not because of the leak. It's not because of the outrage on Twitter. It's not because of hashtag open d d It's not because of the various, like, the the petitions online and all of that. It's because people canceled their subscriptions. Yep. That oh, is exactly why this happened. It affected their bottom line directly. I think, I think it's safe to say policy of the Dungeon Bros, vote with your wallet. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely vote with your wallet. If you don't like a product, don't buy it. If you don't like what a company is doing... Stop buying their products. Cancel your subscriptions. D and D Beyond subscriptions are the metric they're looking at when it comes to is this a positive or negative impact. Oh, yeah. They so many people unsubscribed from D and D Beyond that the negative impact in their revenue from that would have offset any benefit they would have gotten from royalties in forcing through this next OGL, which just goes to show the scale at which people were unsubscribing. Yeah, we know we we know plenty of people who will just blanket buy anything that a company that they that they enjoy the product of come you know if, if Wizards puts out something we know people just buy it because I mean we, we kind of do that because we kind of but you know at this point uh, those people who are say are are those people are what our Wizards are relying on to have that steady income yeah. And subscription-based income, obviously. Oh, yeah. So, for example, on our live stream right now, we have the the wonderful Dragonlance book in front of us, the book that came out in December that we still haven't talked about. Nope. I haven't felt compelled to read it right now because of all this nonsense. Next episode of the podcast, things might have calmed down enough without enough things to talk about that we can actually go into the Dragonlance book because I think there's a lot of good stuff in there. There's some very interesting stuff. And we can get into that some other time. The rest of this statement is very interesting. They released a version of the SRD with the Creative Commons license. And they said that in the coming week, they're going to put it in a more permanent place on their website so you don't have to reference this random article. But they wanted to get it out immediately to show their commitment to this. Mm -hmm. The reason for that, once something is officially published with the Creative Commons license, you no longer own that content. Yep. Period. You can't own it again. It's it's at this point, the 5E system reference document, you can do whatever you want with it, mm -hmm. which I think is a massive move that I certainly was not expecting. That being said, this document does not say anything about 1D&D. Nope. It does not say that they're going to put the next system reference document under Creative Commons, but... It seems for the time being that 1D&D will at least operate under the same OGL 1.0A license that 5E operated under. And we'll probably hear more about this in the future when we get closer to the release of 1D&D. Mm -hmm. Which we're still well over a year away from that now. I'm sure there'll be plenty of more controversy. Um, one thing we... we I've, the Creative Commons, there is... I haven't, I haven't looked at the... Uh, We're not lawyers. We're not lawyers. But I did see some people talking about, well, um, putting things on the Creative Commons actually opens it up even, you know, a little more for certain things like uh, product identity or mm -hmm. uh, uh, protected identity of things like the Beholder, Strahd, etc. Things that Wizard said beforehand, you can't use this because uh, it's, it's a name. A we can. It's a character. Hypothetically, under the Creative Commons license, you can use those characters in name only, um, which is still interesting. It means hypothetically, you could produce your own uh, your own addition or your own add on content to the Curse of Strahd or yeah. something like that. But uh, this has been this has been uh, since Friday. It's Monday now as we're recording this. The community hasn't had that much time to digest it. The community hasn't had that much time to start working with it. 
I think they're, just, they're everyone's just kind of mostly happy that this fight seemingly is over for the time being. Seemingly. We do know there's plenty of people out there who are still not happy with Wizards of the Coast, who are still going who are going to remain unhappy with Wizards of the Coast. Um and no matter what they do, no matter what Wizards does, no matter where they put their content, plenty of people are not going to be happy. Mm. Um I did see Paizo came out with a statement once Wizards posted this and said, we support them putting on Creative Commons license, but we're going to continue going forward with the ORC. Yeah. And all these other um, content creators are still continuing to plan or are, can, are planning to continue creating their new systems, creating their new tabletop games. I think that uh, what Wizards has done has definitely is definitely going to hurt their bottom line for years to come. Yeah, absolutely it will. Um, one quick note. For it to be under the SRD, the character has to be mentioned in name in the system reference document. I don't know for sure if it is. What I do know is I'm looking at the spells list right now and some things that ha- that would have names. Uh, Bibby's Hand, Arcane Hand. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Magnificent Mansion is just Magnificent Mansion. It's not Morden Canons. Is it Morden Canons? Morden Canons. It's not Morden Canons. So there are certain names that have been excluded from spell names, which would imply that they are keeping certain characters under their own copyright, which I think is perfectly fair. Sure. But they're still giving you access to the spell and mechanics. They're just changing things. Absolutely. It's been that way for whatever. Samuel did some digging, though. Digging, digging, digging. Digging deep into. Let's have a little insight into why. A board of directors can be so disconnected from their product to not realize how bad this is going into it. So we got this article on N World asking, where are the board gamers? This is... This references, we talked a lot last year on various episodes of the podcast, the Ulta Fox uh, activist group that owns a large portion of the Hasbro that was trying to spin off Wizards of the Coast. And I think we can now see in more detail why yes. they wanted to spin off Wizards of the Coast from Hasbro, claiming that a lot of Hasbro's board of directors don't really know what they're doing when it comes to the products that Wizards of the Coast offers, the core ones being Magic the Gathering, the card game, and D&D, the tabletop RPG. When it comes to card game players, Alta Fox wanted to put up John Finkel, who is a large Magic the Gathering personality that has a large following in the Magic the Gathering community, up as a member of the board. He would have been the only... He didn't. He didn't end up on the board. No, they went with another, with other choices. Because they don't have anyone on the board that plays trading card games. Mm Mm-hmm probably a bit of a problem when you create trading card game arguably the biggest in the world up there with pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh. oh yeah arguably bigger than both of them video gamers prior to uh chris cox's appointment as the ceo of hasbro there was one board member who was already in the digital gaming space hope cochran was appointed back in 2016 Managing director of Madrona Venture Group, a technology-focused venture capital group, had experience with video games, digital gaming, which when you hear the various executives at Hasbro saying, we want to monetize D&D like a a video video game, game, you can see where that's coming from. And then for tabletop gamers, again, yeah, not really anyone that plays tabletop games. Therein lies the core problem. All of these, all of these, the board of directors have a lot of experience with monetization, with selling products, Mm -hmm. as any good board of directors should. But when it comes to the specifics of the trading card game space and the tabletop gaming space, they seemed like they were lacking a lot of experience. Oh, yeah. I mean, we can see this in... uh we got a we got a huge dose of this in the fu- quote unquote fireside chat. <laughs> I will still rage against that entire thing they did. It was just an investors meeting yeah. and simple things from uh, uh, Chris Cox, Chris Cax, Chris Cax, uh, having to explain when he went to 
cocktail parties. Oh. Cocktail parties. What he yeah. does. Oh. I'm, you know, being, oh. back when he, he said he was uh, the head of Wizards of Coats, people wouldn't know what that mean, meant in his circles, which is fine. Yeah. But you're trying to develop and sell products to a very unique space, which I hope they've they've started to learn uh, that from this whole debacle. Yeah. Um, that the the people in that space are not they the probably probably, probably so many people in the space play video games, but they we are not playing a video game right now. No. We don't want. We're not going to look for for that next that next skin to come out. We're not yeah. looking for little bits you know at one extra mission we have we have exp- we have shown over the past 20 something years and at, uh, well god 30 years of magic the gathering and farther for that in D what we want and the people at wizards of the coast up at the top the ones making the decisions the ones at hasbro have decided that they don't see themselves as as selling that product anymore they're just selling a product that can make money yeah um it it is even mentioned here that in chris cox's like statement of who he is just digital is mentioned five times in his profile and we've and and that was one thing when he became uh, head of hasbro was that he wanted to really get into the digital space which i think we're all in favor of getting getting tabletop like D &D beyond as a service is really good oh yeah the video games that they put out highly yeah. anticipated Baldur's Gate um but this whole this whole thing i think has shown that you can by not understanding your audience mm-hmm. by not having someone to say to to look to for actual advice um is really going to hurt your bottom line absolutely absolutely I want to re I want to reiterate. It is not wrong as a company to want to make money. No, that's what's, that's what makes them a company. This is what this is what gives us D&D is them making products and selling them and having a profit. Profit motivations are not bad. Only having profit motivations are bad. That being said, I have seen many very I've seen various TikToks, I've seen various tweets, articles talking about all these different things that they could have done mm-hmm. to monetize D and D, and I think we we've compiled a wonderful little menagerie of things that could make D and D and D and D Beyond a fucking cash cow and make everyone that subscribes to it immensely happy. Yeah. So they've been very explicit in their intent to make more money from what they believe is a quote under monetized Dungeons and Dragons platform. They think that because. When they release a book, if you're releasing a campaign setting at a table of five players and a DM, the DM buys the campaign setting, which of their customers is one sixth, mm-hmm. one fifth, whatever it is. There's a, a very lot smaller, a small, a small chunk will buy campaign settings, will buy like some of the core rule books. Like you don't need a dungeon master's guide as a player. You don't need a monster manual as a player. You need those as DMs. Mm-hmm. The things that everyone buys are the rule supplements. Your Xanathar's Guide to Everything, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, that kind of stuff. So for one, you could just make more of those. But you need you need your campaign settings. You need... that. Which is the whole point of the OGL in the first place. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> was for people to create their own <laughs> campaign settings and adventures. Now... <laughs> They, it's clear through what they've said with D&D Beyond specifically trying to revoke the OGL, D&D Beyond being a $30 monthly subscription, which is outrageous, wanting to create AI dungeon masters to encourage more people to play with like just a group of players and then a machine to handle the rules, which is, again, ludicrous. They're trying to set up D&D Beyond as their Netflix or game or like Xbox Game Pass subscription service that just does does it all for you. And then they just put everything on there. I think it would be immensely smarter for them to look at D&D Beyond as like their Steam library. Mm -hmm. For example, 
make a subsection of D&D Beyond a homebrew portal like they've done with the DMs Guild or like exists with DriveThruRPG. OGL or now, I guess, Creative Commons content could be required to be listed on their platform, uh, but not limited to their platform only. This would give them a percentage cut of all homebrew sales. All of them. Mm -hmm. They want to monetize homebrew through royalties. Why not create this rich platform built into D&D Beyond where they could sell their homebrew? We could sell communities homebrew. The cut on DriveThruRPG and the DMs Guild is like 50 to 40%. They could take 20%, which would is still a fifth of all earned money from content they didn't make. Mm -hmm. That's just posted. Like they host the content. 20% is still a large cut for that. They could make they could make it industry standard, seemingly, and make it 40% and make a lot of money there too. But like undercutting them a little bit, it would drive people to their platform so that they would post on D&D Beyond for their homebrew. Yeah. I mean, like you mentioned, the DMs Guild and Drive Through RPG. Wizards does get a cut from that, but then these other websites also get a cut from that. Yeah. So, like you're saying, undercut... <laughs> I mean, no one likes the term undercut anymore, but um, it, it's not like it's not like they would. It's not malicious. It's just they would. We're creating a competitor. We were competing, and and if you got to skip that middleman, and mm -hmm. yeah, instead of having, because right now when we post on Drive Through RPG, if you if you buy something through us, I think it's what sixty percent to us, sixty percent to us, forty percent to Drive Through RPG, and and then Drive Through RPG splits between themselves and Wizards. So yeah, go to, to go directly to Which, Wizards. By the way. If you want to support us, you can check the link, the link in the bio. We have the Blood Magic and Hemocraft supplement for four ninety nine, which we would get by that math three bucks. Three bucks. Three bucks from. And we also have our yearly compendium of free homebrew uh, for five ninety nine, which we will update yearly. And it is just an all in one place for all of the homebrew we released that is free, and some smattering of choices from our paid homebrew as well at drivethroughrpg dot com. Yeah, but. Bros. Exactly. But if uh, if <laughs> if we were able to go directly to DMD Beyond, post our harbor, and let's say they decide to take 20%, if we got $4 instead of $3 and they got $1 still, they would be get. Here's the thing. We would much go over there. $5, $5 for homebrew. Creator gets three. Drive through RPG gets two. How much does Wizards of the Coast get of that? 50 cents? No. A dollar? Yeah. They could just host it themselves. Take the dollar straight from the creator and the creator is going to be getting more money and then they're going to be getting more money and one of their competitors didn't get any money. Not to mention the fact that this homebrew portal, they could create a back-end tool set. We use homebrewery yes. to make delicious looking homebrew. Mm. It's delicious. Tasty. Tasty. They have the web developers available. Or they could, they, they're fucking Hasbro. They could hire to create a back-end portal that makes it a lot easier to create good-looking homebrew. Create an interface that's user-friendly that you can type up all of your... You can build your homebrew on the site. It creates a version of it that you can download as a PDF. And then through their built-in system, it can automatically be integrated into D&D Beyond. And so if someone buys your homebrew... They can print the PDF that it's automatically in their list of content available to them on their D&D Beyond account to be integrated into their games. And it creates a channel with which creators can make content more easily mm -hmm. just for them. They create it's the vertical integration ideology, which I think is brilliant. I Like. That seems like a no-brainer. If they want, the whole point of this OGL thing is to make more money off of the homebrew. They can do that and probably make a lot more money. If they're only charging royalties for the top twenty fucking creators that do homebrew, or trying to get like special contracts, why not get a 20, 30, 40 percent rip off everything? And not a, it, it would be far less substantial to everybody you can you could even you can even set it up where it's like if if you use creative commons content in the srd or you use ogl 1.0 a you can publish it anywhere but if you publish it on our exclusively on D, D beyond 
you can access any published materials to include in your own content with obviously some limitations like you can't just copy paste their book and then sell it for five dollars <laughs> you like with certain certain rule sets need to be enabled there but they could give you more access to D D officially published content to include in your own homebrew like being able to create a strahd campaign with strahd mm -hmm. with barovia with stuff that's in the cursor like stuff that's hinted at in the cursor strahd and you can expand it or you can change a stat block and all this kind of stuff that would drive even more people to create on their website over Drive Through RPG and the DMs Guild, even though the DMs Guild already has a partnership with them. Yeah. To begin with. Next, this homebrew portal could have back end support for Patreon and Kickstarter. They already are trying to get a rip off of their creating this unnecessary royalty for certain amounts that are raised on Kickstarter. Yeah. Which Kickstarter said, No, no. No, no. No, no. We're not help. We're not we're not in with you. Yeah. Uh it, that was an entire the fact that they picked Kickstarter of all and like didn't approach Patreon, I think is a little ridiculous. But they could have a back end where they can have this set of tools that creators can use integrated into Patreon, integrated into Kickstarter, and then they become a distribution channel for those crowdfunding options. Uh, there's already integration in Kickstarter or in uh, Patreon for like Discord benefits on the back end. So mm -hmm. you link your Discord account with Patreon, and when you subscribe at a certain level, you get access to certain channels, roles, benefits on a Discord server. That kind of integration can happen with D&D Beyond too. There's plenty of websites that should be doing this, by the way, and there really aren't any other than Discord, which I think is ludicrous to begin with. But having that integration where it's like okay i have my kickstarter account i want to back this project oh if i link my dnd beyond account i can get immediate access to things on dnd beyond through this kickstarting company and then it's all just integrated together they then get access to <laughs> possibly a rip of like one percent of a kickstarter or just becoming the distribution channel encourages people to use dnd beyond which encourages more people to subscribe to D and D Beyond, which is what they want. Yeah. Lastly, when it comes to this, it would allow them to directly regulate the types of content. Their big, their big push for the proposed OGL one point one and one point two was they wanted to regulate content so that people weren't using. D and D stuff to make racist, homophobic, misogynistic, blockchain, NFT, all that kind of stuff. By creating their own distribution platform, they can more strictly regulate what content is being made, and if something is bad, they can remove it. Yeah, entirely. What do you think of this proposal? Because this seems like. They want to monetize D&D Beyond. They want to push people to D&D Beyond. They want to get a rip from homebrew creators. They want to regulate this content that is made. And not to mention, all of that content can then be easily integrated into their virtual tabletop platform that they're developing for one D&D. Creating this hub where it's like you have your D&D Beyond subscription, which gives you access, maybe it gives you like a flat discount on homebrew stuff on mm -hmm. their homebrew store. You can also have your free D&D Beyond account and you can buy a la carte and you can buy your homebrew a la carte and you know, maybe they can make certain, it's like, I want to make my homebrew free. I want to make it pay what you want. I want to make like all that kind of stuff that you expect. And suddenly D&D Beyond becomes this like one-stop shop for everything. That, that would be... I think we were talking about this last, or you know, uh, when when recently, and you had a really good analogy. Is you know, Wizards of the Coast, however many years ago, let's say twenty years ago, when the OGL came out, just for funsies, they came in, they built a store, they built a storefront on this block, and then over time, other stores were like, hey, they're really they're really doing well, you know. Paizo set up across the street but then it's like oh there's a dice maker that's going to set up down here and maybe this guy is doing homebrew over here and they could have done this they could have been like hey you're doing really great maybe we can just knock down this wall and while we sell our 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 pastries let's say they were a pastry shop in this, this sure. metaphor well we sell our croissants maybe you can sell homebrew guy your coffee we don't want to make coffee you sell coffee 
and and they could have done oh hey let's make a you know let's come over here and sell your stuff through our shop but instead they decided all right we're going to take this rocket launcher we found and blow up the blow up the block (laughs) so we're the only one they again maybe this goes back to the ineptitude of the of the people who are running this and their lack of knowledge in the area or maybe it maybe it just goes the fact that again wizards of the coast and hasbro are a corporation absolutely they don't care about you and your feelings they only care about their bottom line the people at wizards care about your feelings and that's how we were able to push through a lot of these things because there were lovely people who leaked all this stuff to us, who told Absolutely. us what was happening um, behind the scenes, who broke their who broke their non disclosure agreements. And if Wizards of the Coast knows who they are, if Hasbro knows who they are, are blacklisted now. Yeah, but so all that said, this would be a great idea, and you know, Wizards of the Coast just. Again, they're just looking at their bottom line, and they're not taking in the suggestions, and they're not looking. If it's hard to believe that they were, they're even looking at the other, that they're actually looking at people who, yeah, video games and how those things might integrate, like how video games are allowed to stream on Twitch, and or how, you know, I can't imagine that there's not somebody who has a Patreon account that follows some random person and and now has access to a special Discord. It's just hard to believe that all that stuff is just being missed by the higher ups. Well, obviously Patreon, very big in the gaming space, very video big. gaming space, and tabletop, and tape and tape. It's it's big in a lot of online create, creator spaces. Patreon, Kickstarter, all the same. Well, no, they're not the same, but all those kinds of things. They have very little knowledge of video games. At, at, in the Hasbro boardroom mm-hmm. oh, yeah. and they see Fortnite, where you sell $20 skins on a free game. You see, they see Warzone, They see apex legends, battle pass. They see like that kind of content. And they're like, Oh, they're just paying them constantly for all this cosmetic shit. That doesn't really mean anything. That's very easy to produce. And they wanted to try and replicate that. The very nature of tabletop gaming and the very community that has built and grown D&D to the point that they could even have that conversation in the first place won't allow for that. And they don't recognize that. This seems this whole D&D Beyond being a homebrew portal in and of itself, which, by the way, they could make a much slicker interface than the DMs Guild or drive through RPG. Yeah, not to hit on those two websites, but um, they are 2008 called and would like their web design back. They are old. Yeah. They are very, very old looking. But they're the biggest ones. They're the biggest ones. They don't need to change. d d Beyond could disrupt this industry entirely in a positive way. They could. Will they? Imagine, imagine that universe. One d d their virtual tabletop, D&D Beyond subscription functioning how it is now. In addition, an entire subset of D&D Beyond that is a homebrew marketplace with back-end tools where creators can make content with content that is published, integrated and formatted for D&D Beyond by the very nature of using their tool sets. You can download it as a PDF. It's integrated into your accounts. You can include it in your virtual campaigns. It, is, it can be it, Creators could make 3D models to include on virtual tabletops. And that's not even to mention, if they really wanted to, they could get into the physical goods industry and try and create their own Etsy, their own Amazon offering. I mean, yeah, if you, especially if you integrated these homebrew stuff, like, uh, uh, you know, click, have a button that says, I would like this as a, as a D&D, or as a D&D book, please send it to me. You know, there are plenty of I mean, uh, functions like that exist on Drive Through RPG and the DMs Guild already, where you can get a physically published version mm-hmm. of something you buy. All of that could be integrated. They could create their own... Like, the amount of dice makers is ridiculous. The amount that people are willing to buy, like, pay for, for a set of dice... Is incredible. Is unbelievable. I've, I've yeah, I've seen sets of, of seven polyhedral dice going for over $100. Well over $100. Well over $100. And Etsy gets a cut of that. Etsy's not a tabletop RPG storefront. Mm -hmm. The amount, there's so much creativity 
in this space. There's so much talent in this space from the fans. There's in- also not a lack of interest in buying all these things. Not at all. It feels like the, the, it feels like they think over at Wizards of the Coast, they think that, oh, there's only so many people pl- playing this and these people are only going to pay only just the, the minimum amount of money they have. No. If you give people a good product, if you give the people the things they want, especially nerds who oh yeah, a lot of nerds have very well paying jobs. Um, a lot of pe- a lot of nerds are going to, uh, you, you know, s- hold aside money. Okay, I've paid my bills. All right, do I want to buy this random thing over here, or do I want to save my money and buy some new magic cards, some new D and D books, a mini? I we have again, we have so many friends that, and mm-hmm. we ourselves have done it where it's like. I'm not going to renew my my whatever subscription this month just yeah. because I see something coming down the pike that I want from Wizards of the Coast. We've done that in the past. The 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 money is there and it's open. It's free. It's innumerable. Mm-hmm. It could be coming into Wizards of the Coast, but that's not what they see apparently. I, it, you, the physical goods thing aside. They could create store.wizards.com that integrates with D&D Beyond, that integrates with Magic Online, that with all this kind of shit, and then they could list all of their products there for you to buy. Which, by the way, it's really difficult and not intuitive at all to buy products direct from Wizard. Mm-hmm. Like, there's so many companies that create a product, and then they have their own website, which kind of sucks. And then they list it on Amazon, they list it on Etsy, they list it on wherever... They want to sell it. Mm-hmm. Wizards. Hasbro has the capital that if they really, really wanted to. And the physical goods thing could just be an addition down the line. Creating the homebrew portal that integrates with D&D Beyond with backend tools that make it easy to create good looking content. That if you use the tools, you can export the PDF and you can put it somewhere else. But by the nature of you exporting the PDF, you got to list it on our site. You're not allowed to export it unless it is listed here as well. So you can list it here. You can list it wherever you want. So if you want to, like, if we were like, we really would like to stay with Drive Through RPG, we can use their tool sets and we can list it on D&D Beyond and we can not promote it. We can not acknowledge that account exists. And then we can list it on Drive Through RPG. Like, it, it's so easy. Maybe not easy in, like, actually creating it. Obviously, no. they need to spend a lot of money and integrate it into sure. D&D Beyond, sure. which cost a lot of money. you got to hire the developers. you got to get the tools that you don't probably already have. You need more licenses. It's fu- But, again, when when half of Hasbro's profits come from Wizards of the Coast, which has two IPs. Two products. Two products. Not Because Hasbro has Transformers, Power Rangers, My Little Pony. Uh, uh, I think they have Peppa Pig and a bunch. They have just so many products. Just and yet, so many. Monopoly. Like they, yeah, oh yeah, and yet you're you the other half of your company is two products. Wizards of the Coast D and D, or Match of the Gathering. <laughs> D and Wizards of the Coast is now selling themselves. I mean, hire Chris Perkins to come to your house. And I mean, if Chris Perkins had an OnlyFans, like a ta- like a tasteful a only tasteful OnlyFans, only like a Markiplier level right. OnlyFans. Maybe I mean, he's maybe he just re- the whole uh, the whole OnlyFans is just clips of him. Reading the monster manual, just <laughs> ancient white dragon. Ancient, no, Ancient. but he's but he's doing it like Matt Mercer style in front of a fireplace with like a, with like a <laughs> glass of brandy, like a glass of brandy, and like this velvet red robe with <laughs> nothing on underneath, and he's just got his legs crossed, and he's like, the beholder, beholders are found. <laughs> just, just he would make a non insignificant amount of money doing that. <laughs> What were we talking about? I think we were we were kind of wrapping up our thoughts on uh, on the fact on on what D and what wizards what ha- D and D Beyond could have been could be still hypothetically. Um, look, there were so many good ideas, and I uh, you know referencing back to there was the whole Hadozi um, and racism issue that the Wizards of the Coast went through, where they had. Uh, just several months back, where where they came out later and said, "Look, we we messed up." They came out instantly and said, "We messed up." But they came out later and said, "This is why we messed up." You would, 
because you know editors and are overworked and underpaid and they didn't have enough consultants uh, cultural consultants but it's still mind-boggling how a company that has just experienced this that probably accounts for what uh, 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 almost a quarter of their profits can just not think of more creative ways than yeah. we're just going to charge people more money and treat them treat them like cows. It, it, yeah, it's just, there is not a lack of creativity at Wizards of the Coast. There is not a lack of caring at Wizards of the Coast. There is a lack of oh oh oh. Sparkling water down. We good. Go ahead and keep talking. Wow. He's gone. He's leaving. He left. I can say whatever I want right now. I can say whatever. I can say wibbly wobbly scoobly woobly. You can. I, can do I don't know why you would. But I did. Anyway. There's not a lack of creative talent and drive at Wizards of the Coast. There is a lack of understanding of what products should be released and how they should make money from it. Hopefully all of this nonsense creates an environment where we can get the D and D beyond that's worth subscribing to and mm -hmm. worth staying subscribed to. And in a way that benefits the community and can make Hasbro and wizards of the coast fucking beyond wealthy create literally this whole thing, the whole OGL controversy spawned from we want to make more money from content that is being created using content we've made. Yeah. They can do that in a way that benefits them a lot more than what this would have done and in a way that benefits the community and create and drives people to subscribe to D&D Beyond and creates integration for their new products and 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 and. and, and. If only they are willing to open their eyes. Feel free to tell them. Yeah, that'd be. A gr it, I think it's a great idea, personally. I bet if Alta Fox went back to them right now and said, "Hey, either A, make the changes we want, or B, said, hey, let's try to spin them off again," there might be a little more support for Alta Fox this time, oh, or yeah. whatever in disruptive group uh, wants to come in. Oh yeah, beautiful. Yes. All right. We, at this point, at this point. We like to go to the TikTok live chat as well as the Discord server for any questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas that the audience would like to write in. You can do that on our Discord server. You can do that on our TikTok during the live when we record this podcast live. You can also subscribe to us on YouTube. Get some content that is in the works, but it's in the works. <laughs> you can, at our aforementioned drive through RPG can buy homebrew from us. There's also free monthly releases. We didn't do one this month because, well, everything was scary. Everything was scary. Everything was scary. So we didn't put one out this month, but we will next month in February. You can also go to the Instagram. Sam runs. We do a lot of shorts there. We've been, we've been doing some Magic the Gathering and D&D shorts on yeah. the YouTube and the Instagram, and we haven't really published any of them on TikTok. We might. We, pro we probably should try. Well, we have other... Co uh, our main content on TikTok it's two is... Two different things. It's two different things. Two different things. And we also have now an Amazon affiliate storefront where you can go and buy various products from Amazon using our link, and it, and it gives us a little kickback, and it helps us out. It doesn't cost you anything. Nope. You could even go and change your, uh, your browser's bookmark for Amazon to the one with our link, and then yeah. whatever you buy... Remember. Benefits us. Only, uh, helps us. only affects Amazon. Only affects Amazon. Go fuck over Amazon. Yeah. You, so many people hate Amazon and they want to take money from Amazon. Well, here's a way that you can they take give, money from Amazon and yeah. go to us. Yeah. yeah. Ah, doesn't yeah. cost you anything more. Doesn't cost you anything more and it helps support the Dungeon Bros. And until we have a more direct line of, of, uh, of content, of ways to get a, get, you know, help us out, all the free ways of, of going to these things, subscribing, sharing, all the, all the stuff and Likes, comments and sending us hearts. All right. So let's, uh, we would normally go to the Discord, and uh, as per usual, we plan things horribly. We'll do better in the yeah. future. There's been, there's been plenty of discussions on the Discord related to Magic the Gathering and wanting to play Spell Table and Commander's Games and all that kind of... We, there's been plenty of chats about 
Dean to Beyond and all of this nonsense as well. So Indeed. All go right. check it out, please. It was recently streamlined and had some channels removed, had some channels added. It's a lot more easier. It's a lot easier to so get saying, a look around. What you're saying is there's no questions on the Discord. Uh, that is correct. All right. Well, uh, we do turn to the TikTok chat, and we have a few questions here. Um, I will say that Mystery Sniper, I don't think they're back yet. But they were in earlier, and they said that the water bottle not having a cap on it gives them anxiety. <laughs> oh, I'm going to tur- shout at them in the Discord. There. Oh, how the turntables continue to turn. Mystery Sniper, a... a, a regular of the TikTok lives, particularly of the Magic the Gathering streams. We've been playing Magic the Gathering. We've been doing a variant of Commander called Brawl, which is a two player game. We've been doing that live on the TikTok. All right. We, we try to do it. We've been trying to do it once, twice a week. Acrylic Shark asks, what's your favorite character build concept you have encountered? My favorite. Your favorite character build or concept that you've encountered. Now, I am a very big fan of Sword and Sorcery. The spell. The spell slinger with a sword. Mm -hmm. My favorite build is probably the swords bard with just a little dash of Hexblade Warlock. Mm -hmm. Just a small little little, little snap-a-rooney of the Hexblade Warlock. Literally one or two levels of Hexblade Warlock. You can use your charisma for all of your attacks. You get access to the Eldritch Blast cantrip, a better offensive cantrip than anything that the bard gets access to. And then you get access to bardic inspiration, which you can then later use for sword play maneuvers. In addition to being a full spell caster with a full range of spells. And then you get some short cast or short rest re ups, re ups for a couple of first level spells. And you can get like armor of Agathis, you get access to shield, you get access to all this kind of warlocky stuff that really helps out a gish character as it is known Mm -hmm. swords and spell casting. That one I'm particularly fond of. I'm also particularly fond of the Moon Druid that takes some levels in Barbarian so they can rage while being in their combat wild shape. But if I were to pick one, Swords Bard, Hexblade Warlock. I am a big fan of, this is less of a specific build and more of a category, which is the one that somebody comes up with and optimizes on their own. I feel mm. there's so many that are like in the meta. There's, there shouldn't be a the coffee lock. Thing. The coffee lock. The those, sorcerer warlock is a classic. Those that you might see on uh, on a little channel called D and D Shorts, where mm-hmm. he yells at you about some some really broken things. Um, very very specific things. <laughs> yes, but I don't like that style. I like if somebody comes up and they're like, "Man, I've been playing. I want to play this." Well, for me, it's a necromancer. I always love a necromancer. Um, not a vampire who is it? Not a romantic vampire. That's a neck romancer, um, but a necromancer. But if somebody comes up with that and they're like, "Oh, this option over here is really cool," and maybe it's not the best, but it works really well when I can do it and it's fun. That's the kind of build I like to see. How dare you just gloss over that horrific pun? It's, it's in my. It's How in my dare book. you? Uh, let's see. The return one two three four says you guys should play footsie. Who says we aren't? Uh, well, they can see our feet on the... Oh. Oh, they can. Oh, wow. Here. Um, oh, there it oh, is. That, there no, it is. Okay. Uh, is. Yeah, all right. Yeah, and give me, the, okay, give me them yeah, toesies. Don't touch me. Give me them toesies. Uh, don't touch me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they also say, what does the guy on the left get the comfy chair? That's not fair. It's because I bought this chair. He bought that chair, and we, we've... We've turned part of his uh, office. The, <laughs> our part of his. Uh, we have a three bedroom apartment. I have the master bedroom. He gets the two other ones because he works from home. So one of them is his office, and we turned part of his office into our live streaming setup for the podcast, as well as our Magic the Gathering streams, which is this lovely table that used to be his desk. He recently got a new desk, and we moved it over here. I pull in. I pull in the uncomfy chair, and I put the cat bed on it. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> cat doesn't use it. Cat does not use it very often at all. And when she does, it's for brief periods of time. Oh, our good friend Pirate Tom. Love love Mr. Tom. The the Pirate Tom, sorry. Zarg. Uh, says, I believe this was back when we were talking about wizards making the dump onto Creative Commons. Says, we need to make sense mode checks. I think they're trying to distract us. I agree. I, I think they are going to, tr- like, well, 
we know one of their employees came out and said, hey, they're hoping they f- that the internet forgets about this and comes back in, yeah. in several months and tries some of this again. When that's that's the thing is, be happy that OGL 1.0a is not going anywhere. Be happy that the 5e system reference document is Creative Commons. We can we are allowed to be happy about that. You are also allowed to not resubscribe to D and D Beyond until after one D and D is out, because once one D and D is out and all of this stuff is established, it's going to be a lot harder to change it. So. At the end of this year, when they start announcing release dates, schedules, plans for what they're going to be doing for open for OGL stuff, for is it going to is the SRD going to be creative? Once they start making those announcements for One D and D, then we can go on the offensive again if they try to pull this shit again. Which I wouldn't hold it past them. Oh yeah, I wouldn't but put it past them. At this point, we know how to make them make them kneel. <laughs> I said Neil. Um, let's see. As a seller of products in Unique Space, you don't need to mess with something. This is pirate, the Pirate Tom again. Uh, that works. I think it should, That I believe Wizards should evolve, but too much bad content is worse than no content. Um, and some other things to that. Here, here's what I, what I, I agree. There is, unfortunately, even in the current, I, I, the pirate Tom. I don't know if this is exactly what you're referencing, but I'm I'm going to use this as a jumping off point. Um, the idea that the that no content is better or no whatever no D and D no content is better than bad D and D or bad content. I would agree in a lot of cases. Unfortunately, the the systems that are already up and running, um, um, DM's Guild, Drive Through RPG, uh, just the fact that there are so many people playing. And and ex- telling their experiences of running of playing in a game with a bad DM or a or a toxic player or something, all that stuff is already there. And the only evolving at this point that wizards would do would be to absorb all of that bad stuff. Yeah. I mean, I I when it comes to me personally. We've been saying that Wizards of the Coast has been releasing way too many products. Oh, I mean, I, 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 yes, absolutely. Both in Magic and in D&D. And in D&D. I would be totally fine if... I would I would have been happy if the swan song for 5th edition D&D was Dragonlance. And then they were like, see you most of the way through next year. Obviously, as a company, you can't do that. No. You need to release products. But I, I'm, I'm much more in favor of, like, fuck off. Go away. Make people want your product again. Then come back with something that's good as opposed to just stringing us along with, like, kind of shit. You can see that, you can see that in so many spaces. We were talking plenty about video games. Look at what happened. What, look what happened to Halo. Look what happened to the Halo franchise couple of games made by Bungie that were really good. They were the Xbox flagship. Extremely popular. Mm-hmm. Extremely popular. Bungie wants to move on to the next thing. They create 343 Industries, a, a game developer that is specifically designed to shepherd Halo. And they release game after game after game after game that misses the mark every single time. Halo 5 was not well received no. it's not a good game by most people's standard halo infinite is out now and released with a lot of problems a lot of problems and people are not happy with 343 studios not at, at all they just had they just had a bunch of massive layoffs mm-hmm. at, at microsoft they laid off a lot of people well not a lot they laid off people from 343 and bethesda which i thought was weird yeah but the way that people the way that you can fix halo Stop making Halo for a little while. Yeah. Let it let it go away. Let people want it again. Mm-hmm. And then down the line, when there's new technologies, when there's new options available to them, give it to any of the other great developers that they have to do something creative and unique with. Oh yeah, people people need to want a product to buy it. In- I haven't been wanting D and D books. No, in, a, in like the last year, I didn't really want Spelljammer. Dragonlance is the one that I've wanted the most. I haven't read it. We've had it for like a month. Yeah. I've barely looked through it at all. 
the last book that I like really actively wanted was Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. That's been a while. And that's been a while. It's been a while. I a really good example of this actually is directly what you're speaking about is the Dead Space remake. Yeah. It came out on Friday. I bought it. I mainlined it for three days. And you know what they did? They, like you said, they waited. The last game, the, for the original Dead Space came out in 2008. Then we had Dead Space 2 a couple years later and Dead Space 3 a couple years later. Then nothing. And then they said, all right, we're going to come back. We're going to remake it. And you know what they did? They remade it properly. They did it, the upgrade graphics. They mm-hmm. did. They changed some of the mechanics that were clunky from the from the original. They changed some of the story that was clunky from the original. Overall, the Dead Space remake. Also, the Dead Space remake dropped and didn't need 75 patches to make yep. it playable. Yep. Oh, my gosh. A, a, an unfortunate rarity in today's current market of... of games video games requiring the day one patch to fix basic coding problems it you're better i have i've been of the mind that when it comes to video games specifically you are better off waiting two weeks after release to buy and play a game Mm -hmm. or waiting a month two months wait till it comes out Oh, yeah. Like this whole pre-order culture of like go out and oh my gosh, I love this series. I'm going to put all of my money in like six months before the game comes out. Sometimes before it even has an, a release date. Yeah. And then you get this game and you play it day one and it fucking sucks. Mm-hmm. And then maybe two, three weeks down the line, it's pretty good. But at that point, you've already been soured on it because you've played half or more of the game and it sucked. Yeah. With all these bugs, problems, design issues, just it's not worth it. Am I going to go out and buy Kingdom Hearts 4 and play it on the night it's released? Yes. Yes, I will. Will I be buying Persona 6 and playing it the day that it is released? Yes. Yes, I will. But you want to know what two game series didn't really have that problem? I mean, if they released Apex Legends 2, I would I would I would wait a little while. Yeah. <laughs> like Call of Duty? Call of Duty is usually pretty fine, but like you got to give it a little while for the network infrastructure to catch up. Oh yeah. Wouldn't play Halo out of the gate, wouldn't play even even some like Sony first party games wouldn't really want to play right out of the gate. <sighs> Regardless. All right. Let's this is not a video game podcast. No, we do love video games. We do. Uh, Pirate Tom says uh, mentions that all oh, the integration, Discord integrations you can do with D and D Beyond and things like that. Rolling for characters, dexterity save. They uh, do have a D and D Beyond Discord bot called the Avray bot that mm, integrates yep. with D and D Beyond. The one he's mentioning. Uh, also, a bot, a bot that is included on the Dungeon Bros Discord server. Ooh. Invite link available in the link tree in the bio. Free to everyone. Free to everyone. Uh, and then, oh, the referencing what happened with 4E. Yeah. How that was just a whole thing. Yeah. But RTGO boom. Four artifact creatures, four rune stalagmites, coat of arms, and dark store dark steel forge. What? That's uh those a that's a combination of creatures and artifacts in magic. I know Coat of Arms gives every creature that shares a type with another creature plus one plus one. So if you have a goblin shaman and two goblins on the field, and a goblin and a shaman, both the goblin and the shaman get plus one, and the goblin shaman gets plus two. Um, anyway. Why? I don't know. <laughs> I don't see anything else from the RT- <laughs> RTGO boom, but uh, uh, a lot of talk. Sometimes people just say things. At least it was Magic the Gathering related. Yeah, fair. Hasbro, uh, our... Let's see. RM Vartan points out that Hasbro promised their investors a 50% increase in profits by 2026 during a recession. Yes. Great idea. Yeah. It's really, really, really. Because unfortunately they saw a 50% increase, which they hope to do over five years. They saw it in three years. And then they're just like, we can do more. Yeah. It's almost like people had a lot of uh, free time. Yep, they're so weird. They are out of their way out their way out on a limb and scrounging for anything that looks good on paper for yeah. the next quarter. Yeah. I, I think that is pretty much the summation of everything that has happened in the past two months. And um it's really unfortunate because we were there are so many people invested in this game. We have we have internet friends who play 
She said she plays in um, five streamed games a week. Just a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot of games. That's a lot of games. That's a lot of D&D in your life. Wizards of the Coast, Hasbro, have, have ruined themselves. Yep. Back to our initial metaphor, they have soiled themselves. Soiled it. Soiled it. Soiled it. Well, that's about, that's about, uh, that's about what we got. That's about all we got. There's a lot of conversation in the chat. There was a very active chat. Love it. Love an active chat. Love an active chat. There's plenty of activity in our uh, Magic the Gathering live streams that we do. We play a variant of Commander called Brawl. It is a two-player game. And uh, we like Commander, so we play that. And we've been known to play it at our house. And we were like, you know what? We should just put up, put up Connor's phone and live stream it. Why not? <laughs> and apparently people are really into that. So yeah. We, so we, we have lovely chats with uh, yep. people in our, in our, in our uh, TikTok live chat while that is going on. So yep. join us for one of those sometimes. They're much less dour. Much less, much less dour. And uh, if you want to, you can get notified. You can change your uh, notifications on TikTok so that you get notified when we go live. You can follow us on TikTok. You can subscribe to us on the YouTube where despite the fact we don't really release much other than some shorts and uh, the podcast every two weeks, uh, still just steadily steadily increasing in the subscriber count we are inching ever closer to the golden monetization ratio the golden monetization ratio of a thousand subs and four thousand hour watch hours which we would love to have that'd be wonderful that'd be great you can follow us on the instagram where we post basically the same shorts in addition <laughs> to various uh we, we, we like we were trying to post more photos and stuff trying to keep up with what's current in the news cycle of D. Find us on Drive Their RPG, free monthly homebrew, in addition to our Blood Magic and Hemocraft supplement, and our compendium, which will forever be updated with our free homebrew. And um the 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 podcast services. Round, round the globe. Round the globe. Apple. Google. Apple Podcast. Google. Spotify. Spotify. Probably iHeartRadio. I think it's on there. I Pandora. Don't Heart Radio. Fair. The, uh, the the space heaters that you all bought for the, the winter snap, I think a couple of them you can stream the podcast on. Yeah, just have to click it to the right uh, the right setting and yep. make sure your cat doesn't lay in front of it. We're we're working on we're working on an Elgato Stream Deck uh, plugin so that you can just play the podcast by pressing one of the buttons. Yeah, that, on, the, that, on the Stream Deck, you, can, you just press that button; it'll play the podcast. We're doing we're doing this all um, for you. I'll do, totally, totally. This isn't just a dumb bit that <laughs> I am unwilling to let die. Well, anyway, with that, with that being said, we love you very much, and in the meantime, peace.